All right. How is this mic? Good? All right, hear me? Cool. How's it going? Welcome back. Uh, round two of computer vision. So let me just get started. We're going to talk a little bit about logistics. We have office hours now, so check the website. We don't have them this week, uh, but in future weeks we will have them. So we have uh, hours on Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, and two office hours on Thursday. So we have lots of time for people to come in and ask questions, uh, especially on Thursday, getting up around when the homework is going to be due. I think that will be good for everyone. Uh, homework one is going to go out tomorrow. It's going to be pretty straightforward, pretty easy, basically, I think. Uh, I want people to sort of start getting their hands uh, dirty with some of this image processing code. Um, so we'll talk a little bit at the end about what the homework is actually going to be, um, but hopefully we have that posted on the website tomorrow, and then it'll be due in a week on Thursday. Uh, if it's you know a total train wreck and people have like tons of issues with it or something, then we'll we'll fix stuff and maybe push the date back. But probably it'll be due on Thursday. So uh, oh, one more thing, we also have a final. Uh, we have a final project like poster session scheduled, so it's going to be in the atrium on the Wednesday of exam week. I think that is June 6th, but don't write that down. Uh, I'll, I'll post it on the website too, but basically the Wednesday of exam week is going to be 4.30 to 6.30 p.m. It's the same time as the final exam slot for this class would have been. And that'll just be in the atrium, and we'll do poster sessions, and we'll wander around and learn about the final projects that people have been working on. So last time. Uh, we talked about a bunch of stuff, just sort of getting used to what the problems in computer vision are. So we talked about low-level computer vision, uh, which is a lot of just sort of pixel-level manipulation. Uh, so this is things like manipulating the size of a picture, the color, the exposure, uh, maybe putting Instagram filters on stuff. Uh, also, maybe some feature extraction stuff. So you know, can you find where the edges are in a picture? Uh, can you start extracting maybe a little bit of meaning out of the pixel values in an image? We also talked about this concept of mid-level vision, which is starting to connect images to other things, maybe to other images, maybe to the world, uh, maybe to time. So panoramas are sort of stitching pictures together. You have to basically find correspondences between different images. Uh, we have a bunch of 3D stuff that we do in mid-level vision. So this is sort of connecting images to the physical world and using some knowledge about the phys physical world to interpret what's going on in an image. Uh, and we also have images progressing through time. Uh, so doing things like optical flow analysis uh, or building up time lapses using computer vision techniques. And finally, we have uh, what we think of as basically high-level vision. And this is uh, going from images to semantics, so actual kind of meaning. Uh, potential applications are things like, or potential problems are things like image classification. So given an image, uh, what, what is the image of, basically? Uh, tagging is another one where an image might contain multiple objects, and you want to name what all of the objects in an image are. Uh, we also have things like object detection, where we want to know what's in an image and where it is. Segmentation, where we're going to do pixel level labeling of all of the things. And then we went through just a few applications that you can build on top of some of these high level vision techniques. Uh, and the demo just totally crashed last time, which I was bummed about. So we're just going to like try it again and hope that the camera is plugged into like a better slot now or something. And maybe it'll work. So again, this is our classifier. Uh, where we're just predicting basically some semantic tags for what's going on. It's pretty sure that this is like a lecture room or an auditorium or something. Uh, see, it gets like portable computer, which is good. We don't have a lot of interesting stuff up here. Maybe like this chair. Oh, the light's pretty. Let's see. This guy's coming in. <laughs> Uh, and so this is you know, just our basic demo of image classification. And then we can go to object detection, which uh, is you know finding all of the objects in a scene and saying what they are and where they are. Um, again, we don't have just like a lot of. Let's see if we can get this cell phone. Oh, there we go. Yeah. It takes the autofocus a little while to kick in. Uh, so you know, like laptop, TV, one. It thinks this little thing is a mouse. That's kind of our cell phone. It's not quite sure. There's a lot of things that aren't in this data set that we trained on, but cool. So those are just some, some high-level vision uh, problems. Now, the things that we talked about last time were sort of image to semantics. 
Uh, and I just want to highlight that it also goes uh, kind of in the reverse direction. So we can also train models that go from semantics to images. So NVIDIA trained this model to generate faces based off of just a random vector that they gave it. And then they can modify the random input vector to basically change what face it generates. So this is a really creepy video of uh, this network just like interpolating between a bunch of different faces. And all of these faces are just like, like they're not real faces. They don't sort of exist anywhere. It's not pulling these from some large data set or something. It's just kind of generating all of these on the fly. Uh, and it can do very high resolution and uh, off, so it's, it's trained off of this database of, it's trained off this, <laughs> it's trained off this database of celebrities, uh, because I guess you can find a lot of really high quality pictures of celebrities, which means that a lot of the people are like very good looking, or else just like totally look weird when it messes up. Um, but just kind of some fun things that you can do uh, with computer vision. And we'll be working on some of that, hopefully later on in the quarter, which will be fun. So. For this lecture, we're going to be talking a little bit about human vision uh, because the stuff we're trying to do in computer vision, a lot of times we're trying to sort of mimic uh, things that humans can do. And so it's good to understand basically the human visual system a little bit so that we can have some intuition for maybe the kind of tasks that we want to do in computer vision and also potentially some good routes forward uh, when we're trying to think of how to solve certain problems, for example. So right now, while I switch computers, I want you guys to just talk with your neighbors. Uh, decide amongst yourself whether or not you think human vision is easy or hard. Go. All right, let's come back and uh, talk about what we discussed. So someone from this area have anything to say? Someone say something. Easy or hard? OK, what do you got? <laughs> OK. Yeah, yeah. I like it. Someone from this area. Anything? Easy or hard? Yeah. Uh, hard. Yeah. Okay. Some 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 kind of mechanical difficulties with vision and stuff. Yeah, your blind spots and things like that. Over here. Anybody? Easy. Uh, 
Yeah. Sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, you know, for people, maybe you look at something and you can just kind of like pops into your head like, oh, that's, you know, a chair. I don't have to sit there and think about it for a long time if I see a chair. I'm just like, I could sit on that. All right. Yeah. Uh, keep, keep the, yeah, yeah. Okay. Yep. Yeah, yeah. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. And we'll talk about some of those things a little bit later too. So, yeah, we definitely have a, a wide diversity of ability in vision and uh, things that can go wrong with your visual system. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's definitely true. The human brain is pretty amazing at adapting to all sorts of things that can that can be different about uh, you know between different people. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's why I have to bring in this huge computer with a big GPU in it to run these things. Right, is uh, takes a lot of a lot of processing power. So cool. Uh, we will, we will come back to that. So first we're going to talk about eyes, which are basically uh, the sensors uh, for vision. Let me see if I can modify this little thing. Oh, well, not really. So, you know, why do we have eyes? Where did these things come from? Well, you know, it's pretty obvious. Uh, we evolved eyes so we could be able to see things. Uh, visual stimulus is a super important signal in the world and sort of interacting with the world. And we can kind of track how eyes evolved over time. They started as basically just these little photoreceptive proteins uh, that are called eye spots. And you can actually see them. They show up as this sort of little red uh, blob on this uh, euglena, I think it's called, something like that. Uh, it's, it's this little photosynthesizing uh, little guy that has a little tail and it kind of like swims around and stuff. Um, and, you know, Scientists theorize that basically these eye spots were kind of the first, uh, the, the beginning, sort of how vision started. And what you can get from these are just kind of like, is it light or not? And maybe uh, some, some rough directionality. So uh, you glean to have these and they try to swim towards light so they can better photosynthesize. Uh, some snails have these and they use it so they can get out of the light because maybe they don't want to like dry up in the sun uh, or something. And oftentimes there's no real sort of nerves or like brain or processing associated with this. Uh, it's just like, sometimes these are directly connected into muscle tissue or into, um, you know, the, in, in some single cell organism like this, there might not even be muscle tissue. It might uh, just kind of produce some proteins that tells the organism something about what's going on. Uh, and, and then the organism reacts to that stimulus in some way kind of directly. And obviously, there's very low acuities uh, for, for an eye spot. There, you know, light coming from any direction can kind of hit it. So you can't use you know, one of these little patches of light-sensitive protein to say, like, build up an image of the world. You can just sort of see, like, oh, it's kind of light over here and kind of dark over here. But just from these little splotches of protein, we can start evolving some pretty complex things. So, one of the first kind of things that we think of as eyes are basically these pit eyes where you have this little batch of, or you have this little spot of protein and then it starts receding into the organism uh, a little bit and you get this sort of concave shape. And now these walls are blocking some of the light so you have a little bit more information about directionality of where the light is coming from. So the light comes from the outside uh, and, and hits the you know, receptive proteins in this little cup shape. And you know that depending on where the light hits, you can get some rough estimate of where uh, the light is coming from originally. And this is actually a super common characteristic among animals. So 28 of the 33 animal phyla have evolved these and they've evolved just a ton of different times uh, People theorize that basically all of these times they've evolved independently. So, uh, you know, organisms with eye spots will sort of have this little recessed area kind of evolve over time 
and be able to gain a little bit better visual acuity. Now these are super simple uh, you know, little eyes. They obviously aren't forming really complex visions uh, of what's going on in the world, but you can still get some more information about direction that light is coming from, and that can be a really important signal. And then we have this evolution from sort of these simple, just basic eyes into a ton of different, like really complex structures that animals have come up with for eyes. So from these pit eyes, we get things like lenses where you put something over uh, this opening and then you can focus the light coming from certain directions into really precise points and have a really good understanding of where the light is coming from. Uh, you also have pinhole eyes where you uh, make that opening sort of even smaller and get the same effect. If anyone's ever made a pinhole camera before, this is basically the exact same concept. You have this dark enclosure and you put one little uh, prick in the outside of it and light comes in and has to go through this central point and gets basically projected uh, in an inverted way uh, on the surface at the back of the camera or the back of the eye. And then you know, basically if you have a small enough hole, you can tell uh, exactly where the light came from depending on what receptors it hits in these basic eyes. What humans have is a refractive cornea eye, which means that we have a lens, we also have a cornea, and uh, some of these other structures in the eye that all refract light as it's coming in and help focus it. So what we care about in terms of eyes is this concept of acuity, uh, where eye spots don't have any acuity. Basically, light that's coming in from the outside will hit this little, back, like this little spot of protein, and the organism doesn't really have any way to tell where the light is coming from because there's no distinction between the direction of the light and where it hits on this little uh, area of protein. Pit eyes have some acuity. Basically, when the light comes in, uh, the light is going to get blocked a little bit by the uh, other structures around the eye. That's why it's sort of set into this little bowl shape. So, for example, in this image, uh, you know that if... Uh, if light hits, for example, the portion on the right, then it can't be coming in at too steep of an angle uh, because if it were, it would have been blocked. Uh, so, so you start to get some more information based on where the light hits uh, that tells you from what direction the light is coming. And then with these complex eyes, we start getting really high acuity. And so for example, this is like a pinhole camera or a pinhole eye where if you uh, send light in at one specific angle, you're only gonna activate a very small area of, uh, of proteins or of nerve endings in the eye. And so depending on where, uh, what area gets activated, you can actually tell basically exactly what angle the light is coming in from. So this is you know, an example of a pinhole eye. Ref with refraction, we have a little bit of an advantage over sort of a pinhole type eye because we can basically get more light. So now we can uh, gather a bunch of light that's, you know, with a pinhole eye, you have basically, you want to get it as small as possible to have high visual acuity, but that means that only a very small amount of light can come in through that opening. With a, with a refractive eye, you have a larger opening, but you also have this focusing mechanism so that light coming in the same direction will all get focused onto a single spot uh, in your retina, and then that single spot will know what direction the light came from, but will also have more light to draw off of. And this is why uh, a, lot of, a lot of species that have more complex eyes tend towards these refractive eyes that have some sort of lens or some sort of cornea, uh, because they're a pretty big benefit in terms of gathering more information. You can gather more light, but still have really high acuity uh, because you have this ability to focus the light. Focusing uh, using one of these eyes is basically changing the refractive uh, index or changing the refraction. And humans do this by basically changing the shape of the lens. So if an object is really far away, by the time the light gets to your eyes, it will, that has like basically bounced off that object and is coming toward you, it will be nearly parallel and your lens can, can change shape to account for that and focus that parallel lines uh, to, a single pot, to a single spot in your retina. If you're looking at an object that's pretty close by, you'll have these diverging light rays that are coming. Uh, and again, you want to change, change the shape of your lens to focus on that object. 
So you can change the refractive index, again, to focus the light that's now diverging still into a single point. Now this means that basically you have to decide what you want to focus on, right? So you can either be focusing far away and then you'll be focusing parallel lines to a single point, or you can focus close up and you will be focusing these divergent lines to a single point. And this is why basically when you're looking at something up close, all of the stuff in the background looks blurry. If you're looking at something far away, things up close look blurry because we don't have this ability to focus on a bunch of stuff at the same time. And people who have uh, played around a lot with cameras will understand this concept a little bit because uh, this is basically talking about the aperture of the eye. Um, we have a pretty large aperture on our eye. Now that could also change, but uh, we have this ability to focus at different depths of field, but in focusing you know, at one depth of field, we sacrifice some visual acuity in other depths of field. So these complex eyes, you know, there's a bunch of different structures that have arisen. Sorry, do you have a question over there? Okay, so uh, these complex eyes, there are a bunch of different structures that have arisen, but they're all trying to basically do the same task, which is get better visual acuity, uh, better understand where light is coming from in the environment. And uh, researchers have seen just tons of different styles of these eyes evolve in different ways. Uh, but in some sense, they're sort of rare in the animal kingdom. In some sense, they're also uh, just super widespread. So only six of 33 animal phyla have these complex eyes, but they account for 96 of the known species of animal. So there's this huge advantage it seems like to having complex eyes. Uh, if, if you are able to take advantage of this information, it seems like it might give you this really big benefit uh, in terms of reproducing, in terms of kind of taking over the planet. Uh, so one, one notable thing about these complex eyes is we've gone from just telling that there is light or having some rough sense of direction to actually being able to form images. So now, uh, we can basically pinpoint uh, exactly where light is coming from enough to you know, project the real world into some two-dimensional space and then maybe be able to start reasoning about these images, uh, see, be able to see things like shapes or objects, etc. So human eyes are one of these complex uh, kinds of eye. Light passes through a bunch of different structures in the eye before it actually gets to anything, so it has to pass through the cornea, uh, a couple of humeruses, the lens, and all of these structures refract the light in different ways to help us bring in a lot of light but still focus it to a single point. And eventually this light is gonna hit the retina, which is at the back of your eye, and be absorbed by these photosensitive cells. And then those, uh, those photosensitive cells are going to emit some neurotransmitters and start getting that information into your nervous system where it goes through the optical nerve and gets processed by the visual cortex. So these photoreceptive cells are called rods and cones. Pop quiz, is the one on the left a rod or a cone? Just yell it. Okay, one on the right, cone. I think that's where the name come from, came from. Don't quote me on that. Uh, we have about 120 million of them in the retina. Uh, and unlike how you might sort of think of like a camera sensor, uh, these things are not evenly distributed and they're not the same and the eye just does some really crazy stuff in terms of how we actually use these cells to absorb light and interpret it. So this is kind of a graph of what's going on in your retina where these rods and cones are. And you'll see that the cones are very heavily peaked uh, right in the middle of your retina, this area called the fovea whereas rods are mostly sort of in your peripheral vision, and actually there are very few of them in the center of your eye. Now, neither of these cells exist in one spot, kind of offset a little bit from the center called the blind spot, and this is where your optic nerve actually connects to your eye, and this is a weird sort of, uh, a, a weird leftover thing from how human eyes evolved, which is our optic nerve actually comes out of our retina, into like sort of the eye and then back. So when light shines into your eye, it goes through nerve, uh, like through basically the nerves that are reaching out into your eye before it hits the rods and cones. It's kind of like in this weird inside out design. Uh, octopus eyes are actually the other way around. So they don't have this blind spot because their optic nerve connects and then just spreads out 
and the rods and cones are on top of the nerve instead of basically underneath them. But you don't have to know that for any reason. It's just a cool fact. Uh, so, so we have this weird distribution of rods and cones that is indicative of basically what they're going to be used for. So rods are mostly used for low light vision, uh, and they don't really, you can't really see color with rods. Uh, they are very sensitive, so you know, a single photon striking a rod can produce some sort of response, and they're really good at low light. So they have a bunch of systems for dealing with low light. They're a little bit slower response time, so they uh, will take longer to absorb light before they start emitting a response. This means they, they can absorb more photons before they start transmitting information. They can also pool responses between a bunch of different rods that are nearby each other. Uh, so maybe a few of them kind of gather together and say like, hey, how, how many light did you see in this period of time? And then they'll, they'll batch that information together and transmit it to the nerves. Uh, they're also, you know, they're very adapted to seeing in low light, which means that they don't see that well in bright light. Uh, they actually saturate really quickly and then just kind of wash out completely. And this is why it takes a little while for you to adjust uh, if you, know, you go from being in a bright place to being in a dark place. It's also why you can lose your night vision really quickly if someone like shines a light in your eye. All of your rods will saturate and then it takes a while for them to uh, go through the chemical process of basically unbinding some of these proteins and going back to absorbing light again. In contrast, cones are for really detailed color vision. And this is often what we think of as most of the vision that kind of happens uh, in our day-to-day -day life. So uh, most of the time during the day, uh, you are seeing with pretty bright light, you can see in color. Cones, there are a lot fewer of them, you'll notice. So rods, there are like 120 million of them. Cones, there are just 6 million. Uh, but again, they're concentrated in this one uh, really small region of the eye. And they're for this very specific purpose of, of fine-grained, uh, detailed vision. So they change really quickly to changes in light, which means you can see really fine details and you can also see things like movement um, and sort of any, any kind of fast change like that. They have this fast response time, which is important. Uh, and again, they're responsible for, for most of the vision during the daytime. Your rods kind of just check out and your cones take over for doing all of this, this work. So the fovea is where all of these cones are concentrated, and it's basically this really tiny circle in the retina. It's 1.5 millimeters, uh, but m a lot of the six million cones are kind of packed into this little space. And it's your area of highest visual acuity. So you know, if you had a monitor that for some reason changed resolution, uh, depending on where you were looking, this would be the part that had sort of the highest resolution. And this is actually kind of how your eyes work. Uh, different areas of your vision have different resolution. So this is the part that you use for tasks that involve fine-grained sort of vision, things like reading. So when you're moving your eyes to look at the text on the screen, the reason that you're moving your eyes is so that the text that you're looking at stays projected right onto the fovea. And peripheral vision is for accomplishing basically an entirely different task, which is to not get eaten at night. Uh, so there aren't very many cones. You have uh, not a lot of acuity uh, sort of in your peripheral vision. You can kind of tell that there are shapes moving around, uh, but there's not a lot of perception of things like color. There are lots of rods, which are good for looking at things at night. Uh, there are also still some cones. So, you know, you can see some color and uh, you can obviously see in your peripheral vision during the day but there are a lot fewer cones than say right in the middle of your vision. So a lot of things are kind of blurry and uh, you, don't, you don't have the same level of visual acuity. This leads to, uh, so since you have a lot of rods kind of in your peripheral vision, but not a lot in the fovea, this leads to this interesting phenomenon where at nighttime, if you wanna see something, you should probably look basically next to it instead of right at it. So has anyone had this you know, thing where if you look right at a star, it'll basically fade away from view. Uh, if you look right next to the star, you can see a lot better. And uh, this is actually used in other fields as well. So airline pilots, I guess, when they're flying at night are trained to scan with their peripheral vision to look for other flying objects, because if they look right at something, they might not sort of see it as well as if it's kind of in their periphery. Uh, so just kind of interesting peripheral vision facts. Photoreceptors are interesting because they need change to operate. So 
if anyone hasn't seen this before, just stare right at the middle cross for a while. Sounds like some worked for some people. So what happens basically is, uh, you know, this is just a bunch of little purple dots. And going around in a circle, uh, one of those purple dots is turning off at a time. But if you stare at the little plus sign for long enough, uh, the photoreceptors in your eyes start to adapt to the purple color. And basically, they don't see it anymore. And then, as your eyes start adjusting, instead of seeing the purple dots, you start to see this gray background with this green dot circling around uh, the outside. And that's because, um, basically, your eyes have adjusted to this purple color, and they don't really see it as being a color anymore. But when it goes away, it produces the impression of, of being green. So this is just a, a kind of interesting phenomenon for how human eyes operate that, that is different than kind of how computers operate or how you know, a camera operates. If you point a camera at something, it doesn't change what it's seeing over time. Uh, it would, it would you know, still be able to see the purple dots, basically. So we have a bunch of different ways of compensating for this, actually, this effect. Uh, and these are called fixational eye movements. And to me, these are just like totally mind-boggling. So if you look straight at something, uh, your receptors will adjust and lose sensitivity over time. So the eye actually keeps moving around a little bit to expose different parts of the retina to the light. So there are a couple of uh, large shifts that your eye will make. Micro saccades. So people have heard of saccading before, I'm guessing. Uh, when you read, you do saccades over the words. This is basically uh, movements that your eye makes. Uh, Saccades also can be like if you're looking around the room, basically your eye will saccade between different people. So your eyes don't work very well while they're moving, which means that if you want to look around, generally you make uh, very fast linear movements and then stay in a place for a little while and then move again. So micro saccades are basically small versions of saccades uh, where you make these short linear movements and they're, they're sort of sporadic or kind of random. But basically uh, these, are, these are much smaller and when you're looking at something, you don't really notice this happening. You sort of think that you're staring right at a single spot, but your eye is actually making these tiny little short movements so that it keeps exposing different parts of the retina to the light. There's also ocular drift, which is this slower movement that's sort of constantly happening, where your eye is just kind of roaming around. And again, these are all very small, so uh, these are just to expose basically some of the nearby photoreceptors uh, to where the light is already hitting. And then you have this even crazier phenomenon of micro tremors, which you can't even see on this little chart, but they're tiny vibrations that happen in your eye, and both of your eyes sync up, so they're vibrating at the same speed, uh, and they basically just shift the light a little bit, and sometimes they don't even change what photoreceptor the light hits, but it might change how the light hits that photoreceptor. And People don't entirely understand all of the properties of these things, but they're pretty sure that micro tremors and ocular drift allow us to see fine grain detail even better than we otherwise would be able to. So we have a pretty high concentration of cones in our fovea, um, but if you actually like went in and measured the resolution, uh, it wouldn't be as high as you might expect given how good we are at vision. But some of these little movements allow us to actually get better vision uh, out of the systems that we have because we can then put a little bit of processing power behind it. So for example, for micro tremors, we have this synced up movement where the eyes move at the same time. Uh, and then it changes the input to your eyes and your brain can interpret that and basically build up a better, better mental model of what's going on in the world. So it's time to basically talk about the brain, which is gonna be taking all of these signals and processing them, putting them together into some kind of coherent picture of like what the heck's going on out there. So an interesting fact is that people think that brains maybe came after eyes, and there's some good evidence for this. There are uh, animals that have actually pretty complex eyes that don't have any brain. So there's this jellyfish where the eyes just connect straight into the muscle tissue. Basically, the eyes are like running the show. If it sees something, it's just gonna like move immediately. And uh, another thing that people think about is like, 
the brain is for processing sensory input. If we don't have any sensory input, what's the point of having a brain? So people think that basically these structures may have started co-evolving together. Uh, you know, you, you form some photoreceptive cells, maybe somewhere, and then you want to start doing something with them. So maybe you hook them into, you know, some muscles, but maybe you want a little bit of more complex response. So then you start building up some kind of nervous system uh, and, and it's possible that the reason that you have a brain is because you have eyes uh, that need to be able to, to do some processing so, so you can better react to what you're getting input from. So in your eyes, there are these structures called ganglia that are actually responsible for transmitting information to your brain, and there are about a million of them. So you'll remember that we have 120 million photoreceptors in our retina, uh, now we only have a million ganglia to transmit that information to our brain. So there's obviously some kind of like compression going on already, just even very early on. The photoreceptors are going to start doing some processing that's necessary so that not all of this information has to get transferred to the brain. Now, these ganglia connect in different ways and they're responsible for different things. Uh, in general, we think there are a couple different kinds of ganglia that are responsible for transmitting different information. So there are M cells that uh, mostly contribute to your perception of depth and movement and possibly like orientation and position of objects. And there are P cells that contribute to things like color, shape, and like really fine details. And these are connected to different uh, kinds of photoreceptors and they're connected in different ways depending on what they're actually going to be responsible for. So then these nerves get transferred to your brain, uh, sort of transfer the signals to your brain, uh, and they go into the visual cortex, which is responsible for interpreting this data. And there are just a ton of different substructures in the brain for processing this visual data. And we've studied a lot of them and honestly, like, don't really know enough about how they all work, I would say, to build like a really coherent model. Uh, we know a lot. So the main sort of, the place where all of this information starts uh, and all gets funneled into is called V1. It's the primary visual cortex. And we think that it does basically some really low level vision operations. So things like edge detection um, and basic kind of analyses on the image. And then that information gets transferred to V2, which is uh, the secondary visual cortex where we th see things, uh, see properties of shape start to emerge, things like size and color. Uh, there's been some studies that showed that maybe there's some kind of visual memory that's already starting to be built into V2. And there's also this interesting property where the brain isn't this straightforward system. Uh, it, it does a lot of kind of backward talk. So the, the structures in V2 that are getting this information and processing it will actually send signals back to V1 uh, about who knows what that help the brain better process this information. And again, you know, it's crazy because we have studied these structures for a long time, uh, but there's still a lot of uncertainty about how the human visual system even works once all this information starts getting to the brain. One interesting theory is that the visual cortex has this sort of split structure. Uh, and this is the idea that when you're processing visual information, it's gonna go through potentially a couple different paths. And uh, these different streams are responsible for different things. So there's the ventral uh, and dorsal system. And the ventral system is often the kinds of things that we think about when we talk about vision. So it has like long-term memory uh, and it's, it's good at sort of picking out fine-grained details. And it's the kind of vision that basically makes its way into your consciousness. So like when you see your friend and you recognize them, uh, that potentially could be in the ventral system. The dorsal system is basically a different substructure entirely uh, where you're processing information uh, at a faster speed and you are, are doing things that, uh, th this, is, this is a visual system that sort of helps guide behavior. So it's, uh, you know, when you walk around with your phone and you're not really paying attention to what's going on around you, but you don't run into stuff, that is often because your ventral system is still taking in information and helping to guide 
uh, the behavior that you're doing. Also, researchers think that like when you reach out and grab something, it's your ventral system that's responsible for localizing the object that you want to grab and actually being able to guide the motor movements to perform that action. So, you know, like you might not necessarily know. Uh, you know, if I threw something at you really fast, you might not know what it is, but you'd be able to get out of the way in time. Uh, so you're not actually recognizing what's happening using your visual system, but uh, you're able to process the information sort of unconsciously and, and perform some actions around that information. So there are, some, there are some interesting things that can happen because of this split. Uh, this means that people can sort of suffer from damage in different ways and have different effects happen. So you can have damage to your dorsal system where you can recognize objects, but you don't have very good motor control uh, and sort of it's hard to use your visual system for tasks that we find to be, uh, sorry, not we find to be, but people with uh, undamaged visual systems will find to be pretty easy, so sort of like reaching out and grabbing. Uh, damage to the ventral system often means that you can't recognize objects, but you can still do a lot of tasks. So you could reach out and grab an object or walk around in the world uh, but maybe not be able to really recognize visually what's kind of going on. And I think one of, the, one of the most interesting things, I think, is that a lot of the information in this dorsal system isn't like consciously accessible. So no matter how much you kind of think about you know, the task of like reaching out and grabbing something, you don't actually have, uh, you don't, your brain doesn't have access to basically pull that information into the conscious processing that, you're happen that happens, uh, a lot of that is kind of hidden from you. And this leads to some pretty interesting phenomena. So, see if this will play. This is a person who is legally blind, who has had damage to uh, their, their neurons in their brain uh, and can't recognize objects, can't see anything. And they've done a lot of tests where, you know, they'll like, um, they'll test the visual system and, and by all accounts, they, they basically don't have any, any ability to see in terms of the way we think about it, but they had this, this man walk down a hallway uh, and he is still able to sort of navigate around these obstacles. And when they talked to him, he didn't really know what he was doing. So this wasn't like a conscious uh, decision-making process that was happening. It was just, he was walking down the hallway like he would normally, but when his visual system saw that there was something in front of him, uh, without going into his consciousness, it just sort of started making these decisions about the movements that he was making. Uh, and this is like, like I, who's running the show here? You know, is it like the, the person that you sort of think of uh, being in your brain, or is your visual system just kind of hijacking you sometime and, and going off on these little tangents? Uh, I, I just thought that was really interesting. Um, so, so I guess what this all means is that the brain and your visual system have, uh, have kind of co-evolved together and have this really tightness relationship. So there's a ton of processing power that's devoted to vision. Uh, the visual cortex is one of the largest systems in the brain. 30% of your cerebral cortex is devoted to vision. Uh, and uh, so in a normal sighted person, uh, when they're looking out at the world, uh, two-thirds of the electrical signals in their brain are, are devoted to, uh, in some way, the visual activity that's going on. And a lot of this processing is, is kind of happening subconsciously. So one example where we kind of see this interplay between uh, your, your visual system, sort of maybe your, your eyes, the more mechanical piece of it, and uh, what your brain does is how we interpret three-dimensional data. So, we, we think about 3D as kind of being this simple concept, but actually your visual system has this huge list of ways for how it interprets data uh, and how it comes up with uh, depth information for what it's seeing. So even just with a single eye, you can do a lot of this stuff. So things like focus, uh, again, we talked about how your eye focuses differently for objects that are far away versus objects that are close by. Blur is another uh, sort of related example where if you're focusing on something close up, if you notice that something is blurry in the background, your, your brain infers that it's far away because you know that you're not focusing on it. Parallax is, 
you know, we'll see an example of it in a couple slides, but it's, it's this idea that when an object moves in three-dimensional space, your eyes can sort of understand that different parts of it move at different rates, and then you can get some 3D information from that. And this actually happens in both directions. So the observer can move around, or the object can move around, and you get this, this parallaxing effect where your brain can interpret that uh, and start to put it into this three-dimensional picture of the world. So a lot of times when people talk about depth perception or 3D vision, you think that these things require sort of two eyes or two cameras, and it turns out that for the brain, you know, that doesn't matter at all. You can do a lot of stuff uh, just, with, just with one eye or just with one camera. With two eyes, you get a little bit more information. So we have this, uh, this discrepancy between the two images that your eyes are seeing, and we get a lot of depth perception that way. We also have this thing uh, called convergence where your eyes are, have to actually physically move, especially if something is very close to your face. So if you like look at your finger, you go cross-eyed. Uh, your brain interprets the muscle movements that your eyes are doing to figure out where your eyes are pointing, and then they can get some depth information from that as well. And then a lot of this stuff just happens in the brain itself. So uh, kinetic depth is an example. Uh, if, if something is flying at you, you can see how it moves through space, uh, and your brain interprets that movement to uh, infer this 3D shape. Occlusion, so, uh, you know, if, if something is in front of something, uh, it blocks your view of the object that's behind it, and just from that simple information, uh, your brain can kind of infer in what order objects are in the scene. Uh, familiar objects, so your brain can recognize a car and say, I know how big a car is, so if it's this far away, I know about how far away that is. Uh, and, and also things like shading, so, uh, you know, shadows and light in a scene. And, uh, you know, a lot, of the, a lot of the things we were, sort of the little gifts we were showing last time, are examples of your brain performing some of this depth perception. So there is, you know, <laughs> there's nothing back here. This is obviously a two-dimensional image. Your brain can still interpret this as having some kind of depth based on the processing that it does. Um, so another example of this, uh, this little guy stepping out. So in this case, you see a little bit of the uh, kinetic perception that we were talking about, where the, the person is moving, and from that movement, we can kind of infer 3D shape. There's also a little bit of occlusion based on where he puts his hands on the frame of the thing. This is another one where we see the occlusion uh, processing that your brain does, and also some of the blur. So Harry Potter kind of gets blurred out when the snitch zooms into the foreground. And this is the reason that a lot of uh, these, these, what are they called, illusions, uh, work on people. So your brain has this really powerful mechanism for interpreting three-dimensional data uh, and interpreting the visual world, and you can sort of trick it by drawing these things or making these creations that couldn't sort of possibly exist, but your brain tries to sort of fit them into some mental framework uh, anyway. So we don't entirely understand vision. We don't entirely understand how this visual processing happens. Um, but we have some rough idea of what these different components do. And it's a really highly studied field, so people are making uh, making new discoveries in it all the time. Uh, I think, you know, one of the interesting things that we already talked about is the visual cortex starting to make some of these high-level decisions on its own without routing it through your conscious kind of thought. Uh, another interesting one is just mechanically, uh, your eyes will actually, if you're watching something that's rotating, your eyes will perform really slight rotations to compensate for that because, again, they want to stay pretty stationary with, ref with respect to the thing that they're looking at. And then, you know, you're blinking all the time. Your eyes use that blinking to basically reset their orientation. So when you blink, uh, they kind of go back to their resting state, and then they can start rotating again, I guess, if they need to. So what do you guys think now? Is vision easy or hard for humans? Uh, I would sort of argue that it's a little bit of both. Uh, so vision is really hard, um, but it is also really beneficial. It's, uh, you know, you can tell because 96% of animal species have complex eyes, right? This is something that gives you enormous benefit in the real world 
Um, so your, your brain and evolution have devoted just a ton of resources to making our visual systems be really good. So I think a lot of the reason that, you know, when you look out at the world and you think, you know, you look out at the world and you say, like, I can recognize something really easy. Like, I can perform these visual tasks really easily. Uh, the reason that you can do that is because you've devoted so, mon so many resources to it uh, that it's basically become easy for you to do. So, so what are we looking at anyway when we talk about looking out at the world? There's actually, like, something going into our eyes and hitting it. Uh, and, and this stuff is uh, light. It's electromagnetic radiation. Uh, <laughs> You'll have to talk to the physics majors about what that actually is. Uh, we will generally kind of refer to things as photons, which are like single particles or single waves of light. Uh, and these particles have a wavelength. And in particular, we talk about the visual spectrum, which is generally somewhere around 400 nanometers to 700 nanometers. Uh, and this is a very small range of the possible electromagnetic radiation when you look on sort of what the scale of uh, EM radiation is. So why do we see in you know, the visible spectrum instead of, say, anything else? The answer is because that's what the sun is kind of shooting down on us all the time. So the sun is a little bit more than 5,000 Kelvin. And we can graph out, it's pretty well understood, uh, what radiation a, uh, a large body gives off based on how hot it is. So, the sun is you know, shooting down a bunch of light that's just in this narrow spectrum at us. And presumably, you know, if you're trying to evolve some sort of sensor to monitor the world, if you're trying to you know, be able to perceive what's going on, you want to get as much information as possible. And the way to do that is to find the signal that's the highest. So I, you know, I, I presume that this is why we don't have eyes for things like x-ray because the sun isn't shooting a lot of x-rays at us. Uh, that would probably be really bad. But it is shooting a lot of visible light at us, which is great because it's also non-ionizing, so most of the time it doesn't give you cancer. Uh, light is this combination of these waves. So it's sort of like a chord in music. Uh, we talk about light being composed of a bunch of different wavelengths, and it, it can be described as basically a sum of, of these different parts. So you take a bunch of wavelengths, uh, and you add them together, and this is the wave that you're looking at. And the important thing that matters is the relative strength or amplitude of these different frequencies uh, in, in the light. So different light sources have really different patterns for what the light actually looks like. Uh, if we have, for example, this ruby laser, it's emitting just a single wavelength of light, uh, whereas our, our sun in normal daylight conditions is emitting this pretty broad spectrum of light across a bunch of different wavelengths. So white light is generally what we think of as containing all of the wavelengths. Uh, and this was actually a pretty big discovery uh, thanks to Newton, who, let's see, I have some here. These aren't going to work because we don't have any daylight in here. but. The experiment that he did was he took one of these prisms and he shined some light into it and it split into a bunch of different wavelengths. Uh, and people had known this for a really long time and what they thought was happening was that they were shooting the light in and the crystal was like somehow messing the light up uh, and they thought that white light was this sort of pure object uh, and the crystal was adding some kind of impurities to it. Uh, so then he took another crystal and he put it on the other side and basically was able to combine these lights back together into white light uh, and reasoned that you know, if the crystal was adding some kind of impurity, it wouldn't make much sense to be able to recombine these wavelengths back together and get white light again. It seems like you know, once you add some impurity, I don't know, maybe the second crystal is like filtering out the impurity or something. But uh, So this was kind of the discovery that, uh, that showed us that white light is basically made up of a broad spectrum of a bunch of different wavelengths um, of other light. And when we perceive objects, what we're perceiving is the light that's reflected off of those objects. So lights have some sort of reflectance curve. Uh, and it's not generally just like a single wavelength that objects are reflecting back. It's generally uh, some, sort of, some sort of pattern, some sort of waveform uh, 
Uh, and so, for example, you'll see you know, the yellow bananas are actually reflecting back a bunch of different wavelengths of light. Uh, and those wavelengths get combined together in our eye to form the perception of the color yellow. Uh, and, and that's just how the visual processing ends up working out. So the color of an object depends on a couple of different things. It depends on both the incident light uh, and the object's reflectance. So depending on what the light source is and the reflectance of the object, you can get different signals. What you actually do to calculate the color that your eye ends up seeing is you just multiply the illumination curve by the reflectance curve, uh, and you end up with this color signal that's just this, uh, this graph over different wavelengths. And this means that different illumination matters a lot. So what the sun kind of emits during daylight or during sunset uh, is a lot different than, for example, a lot of the lighting that we use a lot of the time. So this is one of the reasons that people think LED lighting uh, is like a little bit too blue. So when you look at the components that people put in LEDs to make them look white, there ends up being this really big component of blue uh, light that gets emitted that's much higher than sort of the nice even spectrum that we would expect uh, from the sun. Also, you know, if you look at fluorescent lighting, there's this really weird pattern of spikes. Uh, so, so a lot of people think that fluorescent lights can end up uh, doing weird things to color because the incident light, even though your eye might perceive the light coming straight from the light bulb as being white, uh, when it reflects off of an object, you're gonna end up with different colors than if it were, say, reflecting daylight. Uh, and a lot of people know this because they put on makeup and depending on the situation that you're putting on makeup, uh, you have <laughs> a bunch of different uh, scenarios that can end up happening. So this is why you want sort of nice, even white light to get a good, uh, a good understanding of what it's gonna look like when you actually leave your bathroom and go out in the real world. Uh, and in particular, sort of skin color, I think, has this really high reflectance of red. So if you have a light that doesn't have a lot of red in it, you can end up uh, misunderstanding kind of the colors that are happening. So this light is going into your eye, and at some point it has to hit something so we can kind of understand what's going on. Uh, and in particular, it's going to hit these cones that we were talking about earlier. And each of these cones is going to have a different response curve. So, uh, so there are rods, and we, we talked about how rods aren't really that involved in color vision, but they also have a response curve which peaks uh, around 500 nanometers. And then we have three different kinds of cones. Uh, we talk about short, medium, and long cones uh, because they sort of preferentially detect uh, or respond to different wavelengths of light. So we have these three different kinds of cones and people often will kind of misname these as being like blue, green, and red cones. So uh, there is some truth to this, but also it's a little bit of uh, a misstatement. So short cones definitely respond very strongly to blue light. Uh, they also have you know, a little bit of response to some other, uh, some other wave, wavelengths of light. Uh, and I, I should say just quickly, when I talk about you know, blue light or other wavelengths of light, uh, I'm talking about sort of pure uh, single, single waveform light. So when we look at the bottom spectrum, this is if your eye just saw a single wavelength of light, how would you interpret it? And generally at the low end, we have the blues uh, going to the greens and reds. This is, you know, when you look at a rainbow, um, you're seeing sort of the is individual wavelengths kind of split apart. Uh, so rods respond most strongly to this light that we think of as kind of blue or blue green. But again, they don't really, they're not really involved in color vision. Uh, whereas medium and long cones are both kind of in the green to yellow area in terms of their peak response. Now, the reason that people talk about long cones being uh, sort of red cones is because their uh, response curve extends a lot further into the red spectrum than uh, the, medium, the medium cones. So even though they both have pretty similar peaks in terms of uh, what the color is that they most strongly respond to, the long cones will respond more to red light than to any of the other cones. So, our visual perception of color is gonna come from these cones. And different waveforms produce different output. 
And to, to figure out what the cone is going to output for a given waveform, we actually do a fairly similar calculation to the reflectance curve that we were talking about earlier, where we actually just take this response curve and we're going to multiply it by the incident light, the light that is hitting that cone. Uh, and then we're just going to integrate under that curve to end up with the final response that uh, that cone is going to give for some amount of light. And this means that our perception of color is really just the relative activation of these three different kinds of cones. So this means that we're just trying to, uh, we're trying to perceive light with, with basically just these three inputs. And these cones are, are definitely not created equal. Uh, we have way more of these, and again, this is a graph where it's talking about basically red and green cones. Um, so, you know, we, we kind of discussed that earlier, but basically we have a lot more of these uh, medium and long cones than we have of short cones. Uh, so blue color uh, is, is something that we can, can see and perceive, but we have a lot fewer receptors for it than we do uh, receptors for light in sort of the green, yellow, red part of the spectrum. And this ends up meaning that different wavelengths look brighter to our eye. And in particular, green light will look sort of the most bright to your eye than any other color of light. Uh, and blue light is, is usually pretty hard to kind, of, uh, to kind of see in terms of brightness. So this is an easy example of this. If you ever look at blue text, especially like blue LEDs, are really hard to kind of visually perceive. They, they sort of look blurry. Uh, and this is actually because they are blurry. You don't have very many blue cones in your fovea in that very central area of your eye. Um, and so even though these are technically, you know, like these are both as much blue as you can get the computer to render and also as much green as you can get the computer to render, uh, but the blue thing looks a lot dimmer and is also just like a lot harder to focus on for me than the green text. So we have three cones, and that's how we perceive color, uh, or, or humans in general have three cones. There is a lot of variation in terms of how color happens, uh, and this is just like a little chart to give you some kind of feel for it. But the general idea is that uh, each cone can kind of perceive roughly 100 different variations in terms of color, which means that every time you add a cone, you multiply the number of colors that you can see by about 100. And there's actually a researcher at the University of Washington that works a lot on color perception. So this chart comes from uh, some of his theories, I think, and uh, shows you just sort of the relative amount of information that you can get from, from different numbers of cones. So again, we're going to do a little exercise, uh, see if you guys were paying attention during the mechanics part of this. Uh, we are pretty sure that, you know, we understand kind of how color works and how cones contribute to color. Why don't rods contribute to color? Talk with your partners or neighbors and uh, we'll see what you guys come up with. All right, we're back. What do you guys have for us? Someone over here. Yeah. Okay. Anyone else? Theories? <laughs> 
Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that's that is part of it. Uh, the the cones and rods are sort of connected to these different nerves. Um, I guess an interesting question is why don't they? Uh, but mechanically, yeah, so that's, that's a big part of why we can't really use them to see color is that they're kind of connected to different things. So for example, if, you're, if your nerve's only connected to one kind of cone, they also wouldn't be able to see color. They just see sort of this monochrome. So you need to connect to the right sensors to be able to see color. Uh, and generally, the nerves that are looking for color don't connect to rods. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, most of the time, the thing that you care about is right in the middle of your vision. Uh, and there are no rods in the fovea, basically. So uh, you, you can't really see, you wouldn't be able to see color with them, at least in the center of your vision, because they're not there. Uh, any, anyone have? Any last ideas? So I think one more thing, yeah. Uh, yeah, there are, I mean, so you could use, in theory, I think, uh, you know, you could have rods and cones be kind of connected to the same circuitry. If they responded differently, then you could process that information. Um, but like we just talked about, they sort of don't connect to uh, similar nerves, so uh, you, don't, you don't get that information kind of pooled together in one place. Uh, another big reason is just that rods saturate really fast in high light. So when you're, when you're looking in sort of the daytime, your rods basically don't contribute anything. They're like basically entirely maxed out and your brain has learned to just kind of ignore them. So the rods and cones kind of operate on fundamentally different, uh, in fundamentally different environments. So when you're doing color vision during the day, you have these three kinds of cones. At night, you just have one type of rod. Uh, if you had more types of rods, presumably you could start to see maybe some color vision at night, which would be interesting. Uh, and with cones, actually, there are, there are a few more interesting things that kind of happen with them. So you saw that we have these three kinds of cones, but the medium and long cones are actually really close to each other. Uh, and People think that that's because basically they came from one common type of cone and the reason we have two is a result of some kind of mutation that modified one a little bit to make it uh, sensitive to a little bit different wavelength of light. And this is actually also where colorblindness most commonly comes from is either the medium or long cone. Uh, some, some people don't have those kinds of cones. Uh, and some people, basically, just their sensitivity has shifted a little bit. So a common cause of color blindness is just that those two cones are shifted closer together. And you have a tougher time distinguishing uh, between colors in that area of the spectrum. And so you know, red and green are the things that those are sensitive to. And that's why you hear about red, green color blindness a lot. Is anyone, so you obviously don't have to you know, raise your hand or anything, but uh, I think like 10% of males are colorblind. Um, and I actually have some little colorblind glasses here that are supposed to help basically push the spectrum a little bit further apart if you are colorblind. So if anyone is colorblind and wants to try them on right now, any takers? Maybe there's just no one in here. Or no one wants to. Yeah, do you want to try them? OK, let's do it. So. To me, they just sort of make things look orange. Have you ever, are, are, are you, if you're comfortable sharing, are you colorblind? Yeah, I'm red green. Okay. Have you tried one of these glasses on before? Oh, let's do it. Let's see what happens. <laughs> they, I hear that they don't work for everyone, basically. Uh, so there's, there's, some, there's some kinds where it works a little better. And, and you already wear glasses, so it might yeah, be. <laughs> What do you see? Does it look any different? Everything just looks kind of orange. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I sort of figured that might happen. Um, so there are, different, there are different causes of colorblindness and different things that can uh, contribute to it. Uh, if anyone else wants to try these on after it. You want to try them? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, again, I think I, they're, they're also better manufacturers of these than others. So. Ha, 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 ha.
So we talked about color as being sort of this collection of wavelengths. Uh, but what actually is important is how we perceive these different wavelengths. So we're transferring this information from this like graph that we showed earlier of colors being made up of uh, some distribution of wavelengths into these three cones. And we have to represent these colors with just these three outputs. So a lot of waveforms will actually end up looking the same because they provoke the same response from our, cone, from our cones. Uh, and this is called metamerism, and you call sort of different waveforms that end up looking the same metamers. Uh, and I guess the question is, you know, is this a problem? Is this a bad thing? Uh, there are a lot of colors out there that, you know, colors, quote unquote, that we can't distinguish. Uh, is that a problem? And it's actually not. Metamers are awesome. Uh, metamers mean that we can basically have faithful reproduction of colors without doing as much work as we otherwise would have to do. So if you could perfectly perceive the waveform of light that you were looking at, it would be really hard to duplicate a color. You'd have to duplicate that exact waveform. Uh, this would make you know, screens really hard to manufacture. Your screen would have to output a ton of different wavelengths of light so that for some given uh, color that you wanted to look at, it could perfectly basically reconstruct the waveform for you. Uh, printers would be another huge problem, right? You'd have to have just a ton of different kinds of ink that you could mix together and make different reflectance patterns. With metamers, we can recreate a lot of different colors just by selectively stimulating these cones. So we can just target them with specific wavelengths uh, and, and produce colors that would otherwise, you know, we can't maybe match the waveform, but we can kind of trick you into thinking that we are. So a lot of these experiments actually happened like in the 1800s, but in the late 1920s, a couple big color people sat down and did this color matching experiment. So they got together a bunch of subjects and they gave them control over these primary lights. And they would show them a light of a single wavelength where they knew what it was, and they would have them adjust their lights to try to match the light that they were showing them. So the basic setup looked like this. Uh, you have a single light where the researchers know the wavelength on the left, uh, and then they have on the right, uh, they're gonna be given control over these three primary colors that they can adjust to try to match it. So it starts out, you know, and they, they're given these knobs to sort of fiddle around with, and they think, maybe I need a little bit more of that one, maybe I need a little bit less of this one. Uh, and eventually they get to some distribution of these primary colors that they say, oh, this matches pretty well to the wavelength that you're trying to give me. Sometimes uh, this process is a little bit more complex. So sometimes you know, you're, you're twisting these little knobs and you say, you know, okay, I've taken all of this primary color out of the equation, but it still doesn't quite match the color that I want. What I really wish I could do is actually go negative, basically. Can I like somehow subtract that color a little bit more? Uh, but what we're actually gonna do is just add in that primary color on the other side. Uh, and so basically if you turn your knob too far, instead of shining negative light, which doesn't actually make sense as a concept, we're just gonna shine light on the other side uh, until these colors match up. And by doing this across basically the spectrum of colors, we can come up with these color matching functions. So now given some primary colors of light, uh, and these are sort of the graphs of things that people came up with for this. So given these primary colors of light and sort of smoothed out a little bit, we can now pretty faithfully reconstruct individual uh, wavelengths of light. Now, obviously this is gonna be uh, easy for some wavelengths. So for example, if we want to reproduce this individual wavelength of green light, uh, it looks like we need a little bit of this red primary color and a lot of green primary color. For some individual wavelengths, it's a little bit harder uh, because we have to try to maybe do negative red primary light or something. So we'll talk about uh, what that actually means in a second. But basically the results from this were that given these three primary colors, people could in general match most of the colors uh, most of the wavelengths of light that they were shown. And in particular, this was interesting because people actually had uh, a very similar distribution 
for a given color. So we actually kind of know that there's a, a wide variety, like a huge variability in terms of how people physically perceive color. So even just in terms of the distribution of cones that they have, it varies really widely, their distribution of red or of uh, medium versus long cones. But when you end up actually showing people light and getting them to kind of twist these little knobs, they end up producing pretty similar distributions uh, of a given color. And what ends up happening is that we find that color follows some really nice kind of linear rules. And we know that light is just this combination of these individual wavelengths. So now if we can use these primary colors to pretty closely uh, mimic individual wavelengths, then we can build up kind of any color that we might want to reproduce. Because if we have some waveform that we want to reproduce, we can just look at the components that would go into each section of that waveform and add all of those together and then use those amounts of primary color to reproduce the waveform. Yes, exactly. We'll talk about that right now. So what we end up getting is this basically map of how humans perceive color. Uh, and again, we talked about how, well, we'll get there in a couple seconds. <laughs> um, so, so we end up being able to basically draw this map where uh, you, can, you can understand color as linear combinations of other colors. And in general, if we have basically this full spectrum of wavelengths at our disposal, we can recreate any color. What we're gonna end up doing is picking some primary colors to try to cover as much of this color space as possible. Uh, and we can mix these primaries together to match any color that ends up falling inside of, uh, that ends up falling inside of this triangle that we build. So the theoretical colors uh, that they ended up kind of discovering through this process are basically these individual wavelengths of red, green, and blue that you end up having a pretty wide spectrum uh, or a pretty large area of this curve that you can kind of cover. Uh, in, in practice, we use this standard called sRGB, which is from Microsoft and actually not that long ago, 1996. Uh, you guys were all alive in 1996, right? You're not that young. Raise your hand if you weren't alive in 1996. Holy shit. <laughs> okay, never mind. <laughs> um, so we end up having this color space where we have these defined primaries and we can recreate any color that falls inside of this boundary. Uh, and there are actually a bunch of different color spaces that people have kind of come up with. Uh, for example, Pro Photo RGB, I think. I can't remember who that was. Uh, they, it was some photo editing software they made up these like basically fake primary colors so that they could uh, better capture kind of the full space of colors. What this ends up meaning is that it's like really hard to render anything that's like transmitted to you in ProPhoto RGB. You have to convert it into another color space first. Uh, and what this kind of means for computers is we're gonna represent images as a grid of pixels and we're gonna represent color using these three primary colors. Most of the time we're gonna be using sRGB. Uh, it's a standard that is spread pretty widely. But what it really means is that in RGB we can't actually represent all of the colors in the real world. So remember we had this negative component uh, and for, for when we were doing this, this matching and that's never gonna go away. There's no real tricks to get around that. And the hardest colors to actually represent are these individual wavelengths. So if we look at the shape of this, uh, you know, it's this nice smooth curve. And what that means is that if you inscribe a triangle anywhere inside of this, a lot of the things that are outside of the triangle are gonna be these colors that are very close to being a sing just a single wavelength. So there are a lot of individual wavelength light out there uh, that humans can see and perceive as being totally different than other kinds of light, but we're never gonna be able to display on like a computer because you just can't reproduce that color, which is kind of interesting. Yes? No, uh, so if, if you look at this, there's actually uh, CMYK, which is what printers use, and they use like, I, I think, 
six or something. They use like cyan, magenta, yellow, uh, and then like light cyan or light, like they have like blue and light blue or like a bunch of different like weird colors. So yeah, you can pick any number of primaries you want. And again, they map to these like nice linear properties. So you can just combine them together in different ways. And exactly what you would expect to happen will happen. Very quickly, because we're almost done. Uh, again, we can do a bunch of stuff using this color information. Uh, we can make images grayscale by uh, taking these RGB components and looking at how they affect our visual perception of lightness or brightness. Uh, and combining them together. So in particular, if you just average together the red, green, and blue components, it's gonna look really weird. Uh, remember that we perceive blue as not being very light and green as being very bright. Uh, so you have to take that into account when you're converting from RGB to grayscale. We also have this kind of cube that we're talking about where uh, RGB is basically this, this cube in terms of how much you have red, green, and blue. Uh, we can map this to different kinds of shapes. Uh, this is one particular example where it's a cylinder that more closely aligns with how humans perceive color, where we have different hues of color, we have different amounts of those color, uh, so that's saturation, and we also have value, which is kind of the relative brightness uh, of that color. And so this is basically what your first homework is gonna be. It's gonna be converting RGB images to grayscale and to uh, this hue, saturation, and value. And it'll get you used to kind of working with color spaces and playing with images and stuff. That's all. Go free.